The Roman Empire defined and dominated human history for centuries. At one point, the empire encompassed 20% of the global population and vastly outperformed the rest of the world in technology, government organization, production, and military might. China was perhaps the only exception, having achieved significant technological advancements during this period as well. As such, the standard of living that many Roman citizens enjoyed far outpaced other societies at the time, having an average income and access to public utilities and other amenities that would not be matched again until the emergence of modern national economies economies in the 17th century. In order to examine the economic factors at play in Rome during the first two centuries AD, it's important to first understand what economic data is available to begin with, and what limitations exist in understanding those conditions due to a lack of empirical evidence and other relevant information. From there, we can nevertheless paint a generalized picture of the Roman Empire's economy at a macro level. We can then measure its approximate size at maximum output, extrapolate social economic class data from that measurement, assess the true living standards of the inhabitants, and draw conclusions concerning its major pitfalls and other key confines by way of comparison to more modern economies. It is an interesting study in and of itself to scrutinize what data and other evidence is available concerning early Roman Empire economics. In doing so, an equally important is knowing the limitations and assumptions by which we have to come to understand those economic forces, the types of data we are relegated to employ, and the degree of error we can accept when making generalizations or drawing conclusions on the subject. When it comes to basic historical documentation on the Roman Empire itself, we are already relying on evidence that is scarce, of which is certainly limited in substance and detail, and in some cases modified or embellished on purpose, or for that matter, biased. As a case in point, only a single surviving Roman shield exists in good condition today. Likewise, accurate resource material in which to measure and characterize its economy is painfully limited. As a result, it should come as no surprise that historians have, for a long time, shied away from directly assessing and or otherwise investigating specifics about the ancient Roman economy. When attempts have been made, these studies often report wildly different results and conclusions. With the relatively recent birth of the field of ancient economic history and the subsequent explosion in interest with regards to the subject, cautious generalizations and tactful conclusions can in fact be made, but with caveats. It is truly unfortunate that some of the best direct evidence concerning the economy has long expired. For instance, simple market transactions, which we know were indeed recorded by merchants and traders alike, no longer exists in original form. According to an article in the Journal of Economic Perspectives by Peter Terman entitled The Economy of the Early Roman Empire, the inherent problem is this. Market transactions of this type were often recorded by incising wax coverings on wooden oblongs, which, while effective at the time, was extremely perishable. Because of the lack of direct evidence, we must therefore rely on four basic categories of indirect evidence, all of which are less than ideal sources. The first is vague remarks contained within literature written at the time. The second being government proclamations that while important enough to be painstakingly chiseled into stone, are also quite vague and almost certainly overstated. The third being general archaeological data, and the fourth is Egyptian papyri, which only survived due to extreme dry conditions of northeastern Africa. It is also possible to utilize other, more indirect sources of information, including things like Mediterranean shipwreck frequency, and even ice sheet core samples containing measurements of carbon carbon dioxide generated at the time. As previously mentioned, written sources from the period are often flawed because they are riddled with fabrications, exaggerations, and or functioned as propaganda that otherwise makes it difficult to decipher between hard, reliable fact versus the work of a savvy emperor or employee of the state looking to make their aim more appealing or entertaining to the masses. This forces one to have to often read between the lines. For example, Terman describes the Maziris Papyrus that records in incredible detail a maritime loan concerning an impressively large voyage. From its poor grammar, one can deduce that it was hastily written, most likely by a scribe, thus leading to the conclusion that these sorts of loans were also so commonplace as to not necessitate particular care in transliterating its functional or contractual detail. Outside of business transactions and accounting records, other valuable resources of information lie in the evaluation of the level of sophistication of Rome's buildings and infrastructure and of other durable goods produced at the time. With these sources of information adequately defined and documented, and their limitations equally known and understood, one can then proceed with an economic analysis and evaluation, albeit with a certain level of caution and high degree of transparency.
Mechanically, the early Roman economy was first and foremost based on agriculture and reliant on slavery. Around 90% of the population, more or less depending on the time period, lived in the countryside, with a majority making their living in farming or in an occupation adjacent to agriculture. 10 to 20% of this rural population was slaves, either by birth, capture, or punishment, of whom were considered property of the state. Of interest to note, slavery in the Roman Empire took on a much different form than our modern conception of slavery of the American South. According to Peter Terman, Roman slavery is designated as open slavery by anthropologists, meaning that it was possible for a slave to be freed and in doing so fully accepted into society. Still, most Roman slaves were relegated to harsh lives, consisting of menial or strenuous work as servants, miners, farmers, builders, haulers, sex workers, etc. There were some, however, that were in fact skilled workers. A significant percentage of these skilled slaves were even physicians or accountants. By and large, their primary function within society was to perform hard labor, for which the state and ruling class benefited. It should be noted that Rome was by no means the most slave-dependent ancient economy. The Spartans, for example, had entire population centers designated as helots, basically slaves slash serfs, who outnumbered the actual Spartans by some 7 to 1. Nonetheless, a substantial proportion of the Roman economy did indeed rely on slave labor, the exact degree of which continues to be debated among scholars. Another key feature of the Roman economy was its broad, fairly advanced, and integrated market-based system. With the vast majority of the economy actively functioning beyond the reach and scope of the central government, these markets operated organically with typical supply and demand forces at play. They provided the necessary day-to-day -day business transaction environment, and in this regard, they were truly the oil within the gears of the Roman economic machine. According to Terman, it appears that by the 1st and 2nd century AD, the empire was sufficiently integrated to allow for the use of comparative advantages, thus leading to regions of the empire specializing in certain industries that contributed to an increase in both efficiency and productivity. Terman goes on to argue that the high quality of life afforded to the Romans, at least by comparison to other societies at the time, is largely attributed to the integration and complexity of these markets. As evidence of this, an explosion of trade during the first two centuries was most certainly a driving force behind Rome's economic growth at the time, of which the preponderance of this activity was based within the private sector without a doubt. The early Roman Empire also had a fairly sophisticated banking and finance sector, along with a generally uniform currency. Romans often took part in the loaning of monies to one another, and for every reason, from financing to consumption to production. Financing maritime trade was commonplace and even included insurance policies to that effect. Interest rates were usually 1% a month, and the frequency in which these particular rates were utilized most likely meant that the loan market was not a completely free enterprise, although it was possible to find alternate rates from the norm. Commercial banks also existed that even issued mortgages. Unquestionably, the early Roman Empire was a hotbed of sophisticated financial activity. Finally, a good proportion of Rome's overall wealth and prosperity resulted from warring, conquering, and plundering nearby populations in North Africa, the Middle East, and Germania. As time progressed, however, emperors increasingly waged more costly and less lucrative wars, ultimately putting a significant financial strain on the empire at different intervals throughout its history. Interestingly, during the era of Pax Romana, from Augustus's reign in 27 BC to Marcus Aurelius's in 161 AD, Rome experienced unprecedented stability and peace, which in itself contributed in large part to the expansion of trade and wealth generation in the region. In an article published in the Journal of Roman Studies entitled The Size of the Economy in the Distribution of Income in the Roman Empire by Walter Scheidel and Stephen J. Frinson, the authors attempted to overcome the lack of reliable economic data by combining multiple different data sources and employing various statistical methods in an effort to reduce the inherent error involved in measuring the size of the early Roman economy. By utilizing expenditure data on the consumption side, estimating group-specific incomes, and studying the relationships between significant economic indicators, such as the ratio of unskilled rural worker incomes to the average GDP per capita, the authors were able to generate an approximate GDP equivalent to 50 million metric tons of wheat, which is about 20 billion sesters per year, as measured at the empire's demographic peak in the mid-2nd century. In an effort to view this in today's standards, albeit with a high margin of error, this is roughly equivalent to 50 to 90 billion US dollars, which would place the Roman economy as low as 94th to as high as 66th in terms of today's most affluent nations. Notably, this is a mostly meaningless comparison, which does not take into account purchasing power parity, nor the tremendous time gap between then and now, and the countless differences therein.
but is nevertheless intriguing and impressive to contemplate. Further in their findings, Scheidel and Friesen come to the conclusion that only 5% of this GDP was captured and or taxed by the central Roman state, and that the top 1.5% of households made up one-fifth of that income, which, compared to modern standards, is relatively low. A small middle class made up another one-fifth, and the remaining population, who lived close or slightly above subsistence level, made up the remaining portion. This assumes the non-elite classes received an income of about 425 to 540 kilograms of wheat, where less than 154 kilograms is considered starvation levels. The average income then was in the range between close to subsistence to about two-thirds above subsistence, meaning that a vast majority of the population, about 90%, were indigent, while the majority of excess income was consumed by the top 3%. That leaves approximately 5 to 12% of the population to be considered middle class, not quite elite status, but certainly not the lower or slave classes. To frame this another way, the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality that ranges from zero, perfectly equal, to one, perfectly unequal, places the early Roman Empire between 0.42 and 0.44. In another study by Milanovac, they found that among 13 other historic economies, the Gini coefficients range between 0.24 and 0.64 with a median of 0.45. This places the early Roman Empire's economy almost directly in the middle of this range. By way of comparison, more modern economies such as Britain in the early 19th century had a Gini coefficient of 0.59. This implies a general lack of wealth beyond subsistence, meaning the amount of surplus that elites had available was limited. Indeed, over half of all generated income was allocated toward covering the absolute minimum gross level of subsistence. Of interest, too, is that the combined wealth of the middle class was comparable to the combined wealth of the elites. According to the study, the demands of the economy was largely driven by non-elite markets, which is contrary to reductive model findings. This identifies the private sector slash non-elites as being the primary drivers of inter-regional exchange, meaning that the integrated day-to-day -day markets rather than the state guided the Roman economy. In 43 AD, Emperor Claudius had fully conquered the southern portion of Britain, but Scotland, the northern half, had managed to stay free of Roman rule. By 85 AD, the Romans had all but given up on trying to conquer the land, and instead started to build forts along the border of this frontier. One such fort, Vindolanda, which was almost the most distant northwest point in the empire, and later became part of Hadrian's Wall. Then in 103 AD, a Roman centurion, Candidus, received a letter from his friend Octavius in regards to supplying the garrison. In this short letter that had survived the test of time, we can explicitly see some of the most important aspects of the Roman economy at work, and moreover, why the empire was so powerful. It established that even at the furthest reaches of the empire, there was financial services available, well-kept roads, and a tax system that supplied for Candidus's salary. It further illustrates that the men communicating with one another were literate and were able to utilize a rudimentary yet effective postal service. One of the more problematic issues faced by early societies economies, and even some today, is when the state is not sufficiently powerful and or centralized enough, which leads to the inability to maintain an adequate degree of stability along and within its borders, and enforce, collect, and distribute taxes in the form of public services that facilitate education, transportation, communication, and security. While in many respects we would regard Rome as politically unstable by today's terms, it was nonetheless light years ahead of its peers at the time, with the possible exception of China and some Middle East. Eastern empires. Roman England, at the very edge of the empire, enjoyed a vibrant economy, which included urban centers, paved roads, bathhouses, and even a mass manufacturing sector producing top-of-the-line pottery. Later, when the Roman Empire collapsed and disappeared altogether from the British Isles, the quality of life that the Romans afforded the inhabitants would not return to similar levels until the 17th or 18th century. To be clear, while the standards of living of the average Roman individual wasn't particularly exceptional, it wasn't horrible either. Either, unless, of course, one was a slave. Most of the population worked hard, but also lived with a relative degree of comfort. In the later stages of the early Roman Empire, it was believed that approximately 30% of the population lived in urban centers within Italy proper. By comparison, only 10% lived in cities in other regions. While this is a huge differential, it is likely due to the fact that the elites owned great swaths of the Italian countryside, relegating the less fortunate Roman citizens to live within the tightly packed and disease-ridden residential districts within the city of Rome and other dense population centers. Between regions, there was a substantial degree of income inequality, where Italy itself had incomes of approximately twice that of the provinces. Toward the later stages, the eastern provinces also had a great deal of wealth. Last and generally speaking, if a population 
is living at or below subsistence level, the population will tend to contract due to limited availability of food and other resources. By contrast, if a population is expanding, it is fairly reasonable to assume that there is a level of wealth generation that is greater than the needs of the population. The Roman provinces indeed experienced population growth during this period, indicating an era of economic prosperity. Creative destruction refers to the process by which new disruptive technologies upend old ones, usually at the expense of the elites and or of those in control of the industries that are otherwise dependent on these older technologies. In modern nations, particularly in the United States, creative destruction occurs all the time and is not hindered and often encouraged. To that end, if the new technology is better, more desirable, or more cost effective, it will usually take hold and result in a more productive and efficient sector. When this happens simultaneously across multiple sectors, sustained growth is realized as a result of these productivity gains. This is generally the driving economic force behind modern economic growth since the Industrial Revolution. In contrast, when institutions are governed by extractive political policies and economic systems, it is often the case that creative destruction is instead de-incentivized and often actively halted by the ruling elite who have a vested interest in old technologies. According to famous economist Darren A. Smoglu and James A. Robinson, in their book Why Nations Fail, when Caesar crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC, this ultimately led to the end of the majority of institutions of the Republic that had established broad but minimal representation in the political sphere under the Plebeian Assembly. This sowed the seeds for the eventual collapse of Rome and its economy, even if it took many centuries to finally unravel. This decrease in accountability and distribution of power led to further increases in the level of economic extraction by the political landscape. What is particularly unique about Rome and its economy is that the technological breakthroughs largely came about and were dispersed by the state. The Republic utilized existing technologies like Greek building techniques, the agricultural plow, literacy, and iron tools, and went on to invent things like the water wheel, pump, and cement. However, with the transition from Republic to Empire, technological advancements began to drop off significantly. While some major advancements were made during this period, like sewage systems and aqueducts, these were largely based on existing technologies technologies, and the Romans simply perfected them. Water wheels never received a strong enough foothold to revolutionize the economy like it should have, and the designs of ships largely remained stagnant because the Romans never capitalized on the invention of the rudder. Furthermore, the ability for the state to create and spread technologies is a great asset, until which time the state decides to actively stunt that progress. This is seen throughout history, perhaps most famously in Eastern Europe and more specifically the Russian Empire, which effectively halted industrialization almost entirely in the 19th century. The early Roman Empire was no different. As an illustration, according to Pliny the Elder, a man once had audience before Tiberius to show him that he had invented unbreaking glass, excitedly anticipating a generous reward in doing so. The man successfully demonstrated that instead of breaking, the glass only dented and was easily repaired with just a simple hammer. Tiberius then asked the man if he had shown anyone else his invention or how to make it, to which the man replied he had not. Tiberius subsequently had the man taken away and executed out of fear that the new invention, the unbreaking glass, would become more valuable than gold or silver, thus devaluing the currency. This demonstrates two things. The first being that the man came to Tiberius as the leader of the government rather than simply manufacturing and selling the glass himself, and two, that Tiberius had killed him, thus eradicating the invention out of fear of the perceived potential threat on the economy. This shows the state's role in controlling and hindering technology. As another example, a man came to Emperor Vespasian to demonstrate a device that transported columns that demanded far less manpower and was cheap to produce at that. Vespasian dismissed the invention, stating, how will it be possible for me to feed the populace? In other words, Vespasian was worried about the political destabilization that could have ensued from instituting this device because it would have assuredly caused thousands to become unemployed almost immediately. While short-sighted, it was better for the lower classes to be occupied with jobs than for productivity to be drastically increased, at least in his eyes and for the moment. Interestingly, even today, inventors must go through the government to receive patents. However, those systems are in place to help incentivize advancements in technology, largely due to the fact that most modern nations are politically inclusive with broad participation in policy making. Generally speaking, no one single entity can overrule and or disallow things that would otherwise benefit society at large, and intellectual property rights are secured in this process. When Caesar ushered in the beginning of the empire, he undermined the political freedoms 
realms that the common people possessed, however small, causing the elite and the emperor to have final say in all things. Ultimately, this stifled the creative destruction process needed to grow and sustain a prosperous nation. While it may be unfair to judge Rome based on modern concepts, it is easy to imagine what could have happened if the Republic was restored. Most likely, pluralistic institutions would have slowly become more powerful, securing property rights along the way, and ultimately causing an early exploration and creative destruction for the benefit of the masses. Unfortunately, due to the unfair political practices instilled by the elite few, an inevitable cap was placed on how great the Roman economy could have otherwise become. The early Roman Empire and its elusive, hard-to-pin-down economy defined a remarkable period in human history and consequently our own history to follow. Notably, the fallout was felt for many subsequent generations after its eventual collapse, though the lack of empirical evidence has made it difficult to collect, measure, and come to definitive conclusions concerning the economy and its headwinds and tailwinds, recent strides have indeed been made in understanding the complexities and forces therein, while maintaining caution to that effect. Rome had extreme stratification, unimaginable wealth for some, and great suffering for others, a higher than normal standard of living for the time, intricate banking, sophisticated trade and commercial markets, and finally a political system that eventually stunted its growth, leading to its ultimate demise. Most certainly, we can decisively conclude that the Roman economy was every bit as vibrant, sophisticated, complicated, and interesting as the rest of its colorful past.